from Sand Hill Road in the heart of Silicon Valley. It's The Cube, presenting the People First Network. Insights from entrepreneurs and tech leaders. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media. We're here on Sand Hill Road at Mayfield Fund on the venture capitalist funding startups. We're here with Tara Weissnob, who's the Vice President of Technology and Innovation and Advanced Analysis of the Clorox Cup, is part of the People First Network co-creation of content with SiliconANGLE and Mayfield. Tara, welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me, and congratulations to Mayfield on 50 amazing years. Wow. 50 years, they've been in <laughs> St. Hill Road, they've been investing in some great startups. They really have a great philosophy about people first, and yeah. you've had a very distinguished career uh, in technology, IT, in big companies. Long tenures too, like yes. you know, decades. Oh yes. And <laughs> now at Clorox, a consumer company. So talk about your journey, where your experiences, where you started. Where, tell us about your background. Yeah, well, I grew up in India, if it's not obvious already. Uh, I uh, came to the United States after I finished my undergrad in India. I had an undergrad in electrical engineering, came over here, got my electrical engineering master's at the University of Southern California, go Trojans. And um, after that, I worked for several companies, but mostly in healthcare and life sciences. So the past four years, I have been the vice president of IT at the Clorox company, which is a CPG company. So quite a bit of a learning curve there. Healthcare, serving patients, now That's you're serving right. consumers. That's right. Uh, Clorox, well known for their analytics, well known for technology innovation. Yep. I've interviewed a bunch of folks at Clorox. They've always been at the head of the curve, like yep. Procter & Gamble, you guys are, uh, consumer companies have to be. Definitely. Now more than ever, digital disruption is an opportunity for companies to have a better relationship with their with their customers. Absolutely. And, uh, and changes the makeup of their brand as well since it touches the customer. How do you see that evolving? What's the current state of the art of some of the things you're working on? Yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating actually. And I hate to use cliches, but things like consumer experience is really at the heart of it. We're a brand company at the end of the day and how people feel about us is really, really important. It's not so much, it is about the products and we make amazing products, but how do they feel about us as a company and how do they engage with us differently than they did before? We do not buy the same way as we did even five years ago. And so learning that, learning the new evolving consumer uh, and getting really close to what's important to them that's really on the forefront of what we, how we think about our digital transformation. One of the cool things that's great about the People First Network that we've been doing yeah. this content is with a lot of luminaries who, are, who have had a storied career like yourself, have looked at the changes in the waves of innovation that have mm -hmm. come before it. And yeah. now more than ever, omni-channel, how you mm -hmm. advertise and reach customers, how they interact, how they buy and mm -hmm. consume. If you look at healthcare and some of the things you've been involved in, in the 90s, remember client server was big, oh, they had yes. computers. <laughs> IT oh, has yeah. changed a lot. It has. What is the most striking thing that you see from those changes in this new wave that we're living now? You know, so I was fortunate in that I decided that data was where it was at right from the beginning of my career. That's how I kind of made my way up. My career ladder is really that focus on data. I had a software engineering background, but really uh, felt the power of data to change things. Uh, what has happened, if I think about some of the big changes or the key milestones, if you will, in my career. Uh, one of the first real big changes came about when data, which was up until that point really sort of coming along for the ride. You had applications, applications had data. When data actually became the mainstay and the applications kind of came and went. I remember one of my mentors in the past, a, a past CIO actually telling me that, you know, applications come and go, but data is forever. And when that really started to become a thing was when big data and big data technologies became, came of, came of enterprise age, if you will, along with cloud technologies. That marriage really, that was I think the tipping point where um, uh, the things that you could do with data and the way that you could get insights from data really took on a life of its own, if you will. You know, one of the things, that's a great point, I'd love to get your insights as a leader and as you grew with data, because it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't really obvious at that time. Certainly, people had databases, that big, the, the big data sure. applications had sure. data. Yeah. But it was always kind of old school data model. Hey, let's get some data, let's look at the demographics, let's look at this consumer Correct. price index, blah, 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 all kinds of data. But access to data became driven by the database. 
Correct. So the data might have been data available, yeah. but getting it in the hands of the practitioners, even now is hard, but even back then, you might not, not have had the data. So yeah. as a leader who saw data yeah. as a strategic advantage, by the way, that's very early, so, so awesome for you. you know, how did you, like how did you get through <laughs> that? How did you uh, um, lead the organization to make data at the center of things? It is a very good question. Um, there were a few things that started to sh take shape once big data and the marriage of the cloud started to happen. It started to open up doors, break down organizational silos. You know, when you brought that data together, the business value or the potential business value that could be unlocked became obvious. The way that we approached it though, in under my leadership, I always believe in small steps. I believe in leapfrog, but I believe that you have to feed innovation or innovative thinking out in small doses. People are not always ready to consume it in one big <laughs> fell swoop, if you will. Uh, so doing things incrementally, but with an idea towards transformation was I think the secret sauce that I used to approach these things. So um, as a couple of examples in, in Kaiser Permanente, uh, when I worked there for almost seven years, I was instrumental in bringing their big data platform to life. But it was not just a matter of, here's a technology for technology's sake. It was a matter of, here are some real problems that we are having a lot of difficulty in solving today. Let's show you how we can solve those differently in an amazing way. And we proved that. It was an experiment, but we proved that and that really started to get us those adopters. So take baby steps. Yep. Don't try to do wholesale changes, Correct. hardcore. Correct. Let people get used to it. Yeah. This must have had an impact on culture. And yes. this comes up a lot yes. in the DevOps culture we've yeah. seen over the past decade even now. Yeah. Getting people to change has become very difficult. Yes. We all know that person yes. has their project, it's their baby, yeah. You know, adding features. No, don't take my yes. baby away from yes. me. Yes. I don't want to change. Oh, yeah. How do you, how do you, make that happen? How do you lead people through that very difficult transformation uh, at an emotional level, on a business level? What's the yeah. strategy there? What's your technique? Yeah, so, again back to, you have to show results. And you have to show results incrementally in a way that people can appreciate them and consume them. You have to look at technology from a business value perspective. Business value comes first. Technology is just along for the ride. That's how people see it, and that's how they should see it. Mm -hmm. It's how, what you can do with the technology that makes a difference. So um, uh, some of the techniques that I have used in the past have been, um, Number one, you do have to find like-minded people in the organization. You can't go at it alone. You have to start to build your, your clan, if you will, of innovators. So you've got a target audience that you're chipping away at slowly, but you've got to build credibility because results build credibility. Credibility builds trust. Trust removes barriers. So that's kind of the way that I approach things. I, I bring like-minded people together. I find people in the organization of the people that are resistant that I can bring onto my side, if you will, and I use their knowledge, their insights, their knowledge of how this person uh, who is obviously a stakeholder and an important stakeholder, how they think and what's important to them, and I use that language and that person to be able to approach uh, uh, individuals in different ways. And it's, it's always good culture. to make them, you know, success as many fathers, if you will, is always yeah. an expression. Yeah. Making them feel part of the solution. Absolutely. So I got to ask you a question, you know, it's having a software background coming into uh, the, the tech world and the business yeah. world. This now you're starting to see applications really dictate to the infrastructure. Elastic clouds are out there. You have yes. data as a resource now. Yeah. If you were entering the, the market as a young software engineer today and you were asked to come in and make an impact, yeah. knowing what you know, yeah. How do you see the world today? Because if you, you know, a lot of software engineers creating value from uh, men and now a lot more women are coming on board and yeah. it's still lower numbers, but still yeah. software is not just that software engineer. Yeah. It's software architecture, it's software engineering, software development, UX, UI, yeah. a, analytics, a lot of uh, range of yeah. software opportunities. Yeah. How would you attack the marketplace today if you were coming in and you were uh, entering the workforce or in the yeah. middle of your career? You know, when I, when I look at my career, which is a little longer than I'd like to admit, um, I, see, I see myself as a young um, 
undergraduate student in India. I was one of six girls in a class of about 50. I was striving to get a degree in what was called actually electronics and telecommunication. I was in a minority. I came over the he here to the United States and I continued to be in a minority. I look at my career, which is more than 25 years old. I have also continued to stay in the minority throughout that career. The biggest difference between where I am now in my career versus where I was then is I don't care as much anymore <laughs> that I'm in a minority. <laughs> right? uh, what is fascinating to me, though, John, is when I look at some of the very young uh, students actually. We had a high school intern program for the first time this year at Clorox, which is actually interesting. We typically have college interns, but this year we, um, you know, Clorox, a uh, 105-year-old company in the mid middle of the Silicon Valley, um, having the ability to see that the very, very young generation can think very differently and bringing in mm -hmm. a high school intern or a set of high school interns to help with that journey, I think was forward thinking uh, for the company. And those kids, the confidence that they have, they are not um, shackled by, um, you know, knowing too much, yeah. you know, but they know what's relevant, they know how to make things happen, and boy, do they know how to use technology to uh, uh, make problems that we consider problems that would take months um, happen so quickly. They were with us for four weeks. In four weeks, they developed an app, a website. They developed our logo. They developed a PR video for us. They had an innovation showcase in four weeks. Four little students. It's interesting. For the first time in my career, I can, <laughs> I can uh, admit that um, from a self-awareness standpoint, yeah. well, I really don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah. These young kids have a different view because now their experiences are different. Yes. And so the insight coming out of this new generation yeah. really is pretty compelling. It is. They are adding a lot more because the, there's been a shift in yeah. expectations. Yeah. There's been a shift in experiences yes. for this new generation. Yeah. Yeah. And they're at the forefront. So it's a big wave coming. What's your thoughts on that? Because analytics is a big part of your, your, your career yes. now and yes. it always has been. But yes. now more than ever. Yeah. The younger generation, they want instant gratification. They want value. They do. They don't want to wait and be told. They do. They want to see the immediacy. They Talk do. about this new shift, this new younger generation. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, there used to be the good old days where we could, um, say, put a product out there and, um, you know, eventually it kind of works its, its way into the consumer ecosystem and then we'd get to hear back over the course of time, you know, customers would call in with a recommendation or a complaint. Um, it's very different now. Things are out there instantaneously. We put something out there, you're getting comments and reviews, some of them good, some of them not so good. It's out there and it's it, out there instantly. Um, and that also, and the, the, the modern consumer is not shy. They kind of hide behind the keyboard and they're putting their comments out there, right? <laughs> they're the keyboard warriors. <laughs> yeah. uh, so being able to respond to that and having the, the, not just the data, but the ability to extract insights from data and to extract insights in real time, that is crucial. And so, Gone are the days where you had months to do your analytics. You have to be able to do your analytics in the flow. You have to be able to take in new information, incorporate it into your models, be able to do predictive analytics on it. So technology and the way that it is evolving is super critical for, for survival. So survival days. and also competitive advantage we've heard from oh, other, sure. other C, C, CIOs and also CISOs from a security standpoint, yes. there's business risks yes. involved. Yes. How real time do you see the advantage being, obviously, near real time is pretty much what people talk about. Real yeah. time is to the second. Self-driving cars will certainly yeah, need that. Yeah, yeah. But as a leader, chasing the real time holy grail yeah. seems to be a theme we hear. What's your? How do you react to that? And how do you view real time data? Uh, there, there is definitely something that builds up to the richness of data that you can take advantage of in uh, real time. And I'm saying real time in quotes because there is a contextuality associated with it. Do you, you have to, uh, the, the, the wonder of, uh, you know, modern advanced analytics and machine learning is that you have an existing model that you're tweaking and evolving with new information. And that model is serving as your guide as you receive new information. So does it have to be 
reactive or can it be proactive? You're yeah. building the insights and then you're adding on new information as you see it. And you're, you're using technology to help you make more holistic decisions. And at the end of the day, there is something to be said yeah. about the human aspect of it. The machine can give you guidance, but yeah. the human being needs to make the decision. I'd love to ask you a quick question on that because I think this is something we talk about all the time. Humans yes. are critical in the equation. Machines augment yes. the humans. Yes. Uh, in the data world, if you're data driven, which has been you know, the cliche, we're data driven. Yes. Yes. It takes on multiple forms. I've yes. seen multiple actors saying, we're data driven, but they're really just correlating data. Yeah. The causation side of it is, you know, what's causing things, that's more of a management thing. Yeah. So causation and correlation yes. are two different variables in the analytics field right now that are, yeah. are being amplified as, you got to know the distinction between correlation because you can correlate anything. Causation is something that might be more designed towards yeah. figuring out something and you really can't rest on one more than the other. Your yeah. thoughts on the, the balance <laughs> between talking, the two. You're talking to someone who worked in healthcare for, <laughs> <laughs> so I for, get your for almost seven years. Uh, causation and correlation are, uh, are, are more important than ever. Are more important than ever. And um, I think more and more the, the boundary between what machines can do and how they can augment human beings versus actually having the machines help you make decisions, um, it's, it's getting fuzzier and machines are able to do more and more. I mean, all of the knowledge that you could read about 24 hours a day cannot sit in your head. You have to be able to um, leverage machines to help you make those decisions. So as far as causation and correlation, I think um, the correlation is something that the machine can be the master of. It can see patterns where you may not even think to look for patterns. So I think that, let's, let's give it up to the machines. Correlation yeah. is where yeah, they got the, machi that. the machines have got that, and you got to set them up so that they can do that for you. Causation is, is where the tricky area uh, starts to happen because there is a lot to say, especially when you talk about doctors, about experience and working with individuals. Each individual is different. You can't say that uh, you know the causation for this person is the same as that because the correlations are similar. Uh, no, you have to look. There are so many factors that go into um, you know, what is causing yeah. a disease or yeah. a condition in a person. So I think that is where the human yeah. element and experience really, really still make a difference. In the media business, we call it behavioral and contextual. Context, yeah. context is yeah. really important it for is. really aligning with whatever the problem statement yes. may be. Yes. Correlation, yep. behavior, machines can do that. Correct. That's awesome, great, great, yeah. great insight there. Yeah. A final question for you is for other uh, uh, folks out there, CIOs or IT executives, as they look at the digital transformation journey, which again, very cliche, but very real, yeah. there's a lot of opportunities, but also potential pitfalls if not executed properly. Yeah. Your thoughts on general um, roadmaps or best practices around how to tackle transformation if they're doing it coming for the first time or the beginning, or if they're in the middle of a digital transformation, they're yeah. stuck in the mud or yeah. oh, oh yeah. my God, my head people, person quit, I got to get more people, yeah. I need developers, yeah. or people on the back end of transformation, different parts of the journey. What's your advice? Yeah, I, I've got a couple of, um, again, from the scars of my past, um, a, a couple of things that I think are important. Number one, um, when I joined Clorox, I had the stretch goal of uh, actually building out their cybersecurity program. I had not done that in my uh, in my previous um, uh, the previous part of my career I was an enterprise architect that's where I would spend most of my my many years uh, but cybersecurity and I hired the CISO and built out that program for Clorox it puts a whole different lens on how you look at your transformation and it is an important lens and I think I would not have been rounded as either an enterprise architect who's developing technology strategy or a digital technology innovator if I did not have that lens of there is risk that you need to consider. Now, the point to remember is that you can't over-rotate one way or the other. You have to consider risk and opportunity, and there's a fine line, and I think the smartest CIOs and senior executives know where that fine line exists and are able to tell when you need to yeah. go this way or that way. So that's, that's one thing that I would say is, don't lose that lens. You know, technology can do wonderful things for you, but so can the hackers from a different uh, you angle. You gotta be aware, and you then gotta you gotta aware. shape it too as it evolves. Is that something that you see as important? You you have to have that lens of, you know, you, you're doing this wonderful, amazing thing. However, what if the unintended audience is able to access 
whatever you're doing yeah. and what can they do with it. So that's one thing that I would say is keep that balance in mind. Again, don't over-rotate one way or the other, but keep that balance in mind. The other thing that I would say is innovation is a state of mind that needs to be nurtured and developed, and it needs to be uh, sought from every part of the organization. The, the only way to scale innovation is to have everybody be an innovator in the organization. So that would be my advice is innovation can come from the youngest high school intern, or we actually just had someone at Clorox celebrate that 50th year at Clorox. So, you know, yeah. innovation can come from anywhere in the organization. You have to always be ready, open-minded, and prepared to grab that opportunity when it happens. My final takeaway uh, for this is, is in context to where we are now. We're in Sand Hill Road yes. at Mayfield Fund. They're venture capitalists. Yes. They fund early stage and growth. Yes. Um, the younger generation, we just talked about the insights that they can have. New yes. shifts are happening in experiences, yes. expectations. Yes. The startups more than ever have an opportunity to have yes. customers like Clorox, yes. which used to be, well, startup risk, don't go through the, Go through TSA and when you get approved, and we'll, we'll talk to you kind of thing. <laughs> it's like, it's a, pain, it's a main, big, painful process. Now more than ever, be. startups want to land the big Clorox yeah. deals. They want to show the value proposition, time to value shortening with cloud and other things. How, what's your advice to startups who want to sell to you or hope to aspire to be successful in the marketplace? You know, I, I love startups um, and I spend a lot of time with them. Um, what I have seen as differentiating in some in, in the startups that I have seen is some of them, you know, they're they're out there. They they want your business. So they are looking at you from that, you know, can I get your business? And then there are other startups that I'm sure they've got that lens, but they don't make it obvious to you. To them, the value is in working with you. You know, you're a, you're a company that ha is well reputed. You've got a ton of amazing data that can be used, you know, to develop your models. Uh, you've got a ton of insights and understanding of the business that you can get by just working with this reputed company like Clorox. Uh, those in itself, you can't put a tangible material value on that, but that is what helps startups build relevant and amazing products. And that in itself is payment. The money will come, but look to the experiences, look to the ability to leverage data, and above all, look to how you can position your product in a way that it is solving a business problem. Don't do technology for So technology most sake. venture, so your advice would be, don't focus on the, the PO, if they're venture back, they probably have some runway. Yes. Focus on the value proposition. Absolutely, and learning how companies operate and what's important to them. Take the time to do that. How about scale? You hear that a lot with startups. They want to try to use um, the value proposition. One, they have to get in the door and show value. So that's one kind of table stakes, get okay. through the door. Yep. Then it's more about how they can op be operationalized. That becomes something I've seen with startups. What's your thoughts on that? Because one of the benefits of getting in the door is getting in the door, but staying in yeah. is about operationalizing that new value proposition. Yeah. How do you look at that as a, as a leader? Yeah, the word operationalization is an interesting one. So companies like Clorox, I mean, while I love to work with startups, I will tell you that I do experiments for six, eight weeks. We've got a metric. If we go beyond that, you know, it's probably a project that needs to come, go through a different uh, route. But we do these experiments, we do them quickly. The thing that we do worry about is, okay, great startup, great product. Is it enterprise ready, you know? And I think that is where a lot of startups struggle a little bit is, um, can they prove to you that their product is Fort Knox, that it won't be a way uh, through which your systems get hacked? Uh, can they prove to you that they've got a good um, handle on where they're going, what their roadmap is, what capabilities they uh, are developing in, in their roadmap? Can they showcase that to you in a way that makes sense to you? We're looking for companies that are not just here today and gone tomorrow, companies that are here for the long run. And then, even if they can't do yeah. all of that, show that you integrate really well with other products. Because guess what? Yeah. If you don't work out so well for us, little startup, we want to be able to replace you. We want to have that option. Yeah. And if you don't integrate seamlessly with and can be plucked out and put back in again, then you know we're, we're stuck with yeah. something that we can't extract from our environment. So they've got, we've, they've got to think how we think, is what I would advise them. Tara, <laughs> thanks so much for this great insight for startups out there, for 
folks entering their career, for other women who are looking to break into tech, we have a great inspirational leader here. Thank, Thank you. you for spending the time, really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I'm John Furrier, you're watching the People First program with SiliconANGLE and Mayfield, thanks for watching. Oh.